All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast, we usually broadcast the show every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Today it's Tuesday um, it, that we're doing a special um, episode because tomorrow is the Veterans Day holiday here in the United States. So we are, as a state agency, we're closed. So today's Tuesday, but normally we're on Wednesdays, 99% of the time. Um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to watch. So if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays or whenever we broadcast, that's fine. You can always go to our um, archives and see all of those. So, and I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. For anybody here, um, with us today, I know we had a lot of people that registered not from Nebraska. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, uh, similar to the state library in other states. So we provide services to all types of libraries in Nebraska. So on our shows, our upcoming shows and our archives, you will find topics that just pretty much run the gamut of anything library related. Um, things for publics, K-12, academics, um, historical societies, archives, are really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, um, any types of libraries. Something libraries are doing, something cool we think they could be doing. Um, we sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff come in and talk about specific things that are uh, we're offering here in Nebraska. Um, we also bring in guest speakers from all across the state and the country. Um, and that's what we have with us today and we'll get into today's show um, in just a second. I'm going to, before we get into today's show, I'm going to pop over to our Library Commission website. Um, I've been doing this every week just to remind people um, here in Nebraska and across the country. Uh, we are still in the height and getting worse of the COVID-19 pandemic. And here at the Library Commission, we are attempting to gather resources and information to help our libraries deal with it, how they want to be open, closed, whatever they are doing in their libraries. We have a link that's pinned here at the top of our webpage, always will be at the top above any of our other posts about pandemic resources we have gathered. And we are attempting to keep a listing of Nebraska libraries, who's open, who's closed, who's reclosed, because things have gotten worse and they had to um, close up again. So uh, we're keeping a list there, just Nebraska Library. So if you're a Nebraska Library, let us know if we need to update your info there. Uh, just show you here the page we have here. We have a form online libraries can use. You have some maps. And then we have this link here that goes some resources, things you can use in your library to help um, your patrons uh, with unemployment, financial help. What do I do with my kids, homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the second, uh, link here I want to highlight is specifically for libraries. So things here we are just gathering resources, things to help you out with how do I close, how do I reopen, what should I be doing, uh, special information for school libraries. Uh, this is specific as far as meetings, this is specific to Nebraska, or what our stat state statutes are. Check your own state to see what you, are, um, what you can do for meetings if you need to have open meetings. Um, any other resources we've gathered. We're always updating this page. We have staff that are, you know, seeing what's going on out there, updated information about COVID-19, about what libraries, archives can do. So we're always adding to this page. So please do keep an eye on it. It's open to anyone to use, of course. Uh, some of the information is Nebraska specific, so be careful with what you look at here. Um, but could be good information for anybody. If you're not in Nebraska, check with your state library or your state library association. They may be doing the same thing for you. So uh, always just reminding people of that every week. So now let's get into uh, this week's Encompass Live. Um, first, first, I am going to switch the presentation to you, Britt, so we can get your slides up. So you should see that. Awesome. All right. So today we are talking about uh, learning German, which I don't know anything about. So hopefully I'll learn something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, my director actually said something to me this morning in a meeting when I was leaving, and I'm like, Sure, I don't know what that is, but let's find out. <laughs> um, but this is more about creating an open educational resource. This is something very useful to um, people who are, as we are a lot today, not able to get into our usual coursework. Um, German language learning. So I'm just going to pass it over to you guys to um, uh, take it away and introduce yourself and tell us what you've done here with this great resource. All right, hi, my name is Luann Trevier. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm the Digital Initiatives and Scholarly Communications Librarian at McAllister College 
in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, today we're going to jump right into a story about Renzenlos Deutsch, an open educational resource curriculum. Um, we're going to make a few assumptions like that you're familiar with the concept of open educational resources, but we'll pause throughout the session to take questions and there will be time for questions at the end. So no worries if you're not um, really familiar with that term. Uh, we'll start out with the point where the seed for this idea was planted, take you through some of the decisions in making the curriculum more inclusive, throw in a few details on the creation process for more of the techie types, and include a snapshot of the numerous collaborators that have supported this project. I am just one of the many hands that has worked on and touched this project. So I'll hand it over to Britt. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Krista, for inviting us to be here. We're really excited to present to you all today. Um, my name is Britt Abel. I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm a faculty member in German studies at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I also serve as the director of writing there. Um, but I'm here today because um, I'm one of the co-PIs and um, co-lead authors of Cleanse and Los Deutsch. Um, before we get started, though, um, uh, we wanted to uh, just acknowledge that um, Luann and I are both at McAllister College, um, and we'd like to take a moment to honor the fact that McAllister College sits on Dakota land. It's the ancestral homeland of the Dakota people who were forcibly exiled from the land because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism. So we want to make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota people, ancestors, and descendants, as well as the land itself. We'll take just a second. I just want to let that sit with us for a minute before we move on. So um, I thought I'd begin telling you the story of how my current project began. Um, so Grenzenlos Deutsch, um, which means German without borders, is an open access, no cost curriculum for use in the first year German classroom. This project aspires to provide in a collaborative format an inclusive curriculum containing queered material and material that reflects the diversity of class, race, gender, and ethnicity of our students. Origin story, yes, it is indeed Facebook. So um, as you can see, March 11th, 2015, there was this Facebook post. You see a bunch of likes and a bunch of comments in there. Um, uh, that was my like, there's some, a bunch of my comments in there. But um, I wanted to explain to you kind of what happened in the two weeks prior to this Facebook post. There were some other things that were going on in my brain. So, um, first of all, there was a lunchtime talk at McAllister College's DeWitt Wallace Library, where Luann works, um, and this was a talk about open textbooks with the director, the then director of the library, Terry Fischel, and um, Ron Jocelyn, who was also an employee at the library and an OER expert. This is an image from, um, from their slides. So, I went to that talk. The very same week, I attended um, the Central States College um, on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, the friendly conference, they say. Um, and I went to a panel on heteronormativity in language classrooms. Um, this was a panel that was organized by my friend and colleague, Isolde Müller. Um, and uh, we talked a lot about heteronormativity in the language classroom and kind of shared stories about our attempts to diversify the language curriculum. Um, at the time, I was kind of shocked to hear that there were textbook authors who had written gay characters into textbooks and those characters were taken out um, because the publishers were thinking about how to publish to the greatest variety of institutions. Um, but that felt really discouraging to me. Um, these were both events, this, this lunchtime talk about OER and this talk about heteronormativity in the language class. They were both events that, that made me think hard um, about the materials I use in my classroom. Um, and, you know, I'd been thinking about this for a while, but this kind of confluence of events made me think a little bit harder about it. So, 
you have to understand that at the time I was using um, what I think is the best German textbook out there. There is so much that I like about it. It uses wonderful pictures, it introduces vocabulary with pictures, and it has these fun comics like this one um, as a prompt for students to kind of use their narrative skills to tell a story. Um, Here's a, a nice little uh, picture story it's called about the circus and perhaps you can see that that this this young boy Michel Push goes to the circus he's sitting in the audience and built in the second picture you see the little arrow where he's sitting in the audience um, and there are all the wonderful things at the circus and there's this beautiful a uh, tightrope walker and he just can't stop thinking about her in school he can't do his work and after school he runs away to the circus his plan is to work for the circus and to marry the the tightrope walker and so he feeds the horses and the elephants he um eventually i always laugh at this a couple days later his parents come and pick him up i'm like a couple days um and he's sad and he has to go back to work and he always thinks of the beautiful tightrope walker. Um, so this is a funny little story and there are so many of these. I love the images, um, but I'll tell you what I don't like. I, I don't like that pretty much the central narrative arc of this textbook is a heterosexual love story. Um, and it's often with male identified characters and young boys often as the subjects and girls as the objects. This this is one example of many, and it explains why an additive approach can't fix what's wrong with this textbook. I can't just throw in, this is how you say partner, this is how you talk about the plural of fathers and the plural of mothers um, for, for, uh, for students with queer parents, right? The central narrative of this textbook is a heterosexual love story. Um, and at my institution, I often felt like I had to apologize for the materials I was teaching with. I also, um, you know, I did things in class to kind of counteract this narrative, but there was still the fact that this is what the uh, textbook was selling us, basically. And selling us, indeed, it was because there's also the cost, right? Um, we all know that textbooks are really expensive, and this textbook gets reissued every three-ish years, often without substantive changes, but new page numbers, right? Um, and, and the cost has become a bigger and bigger issue for my students, and more and more students were asking for a way around it. Um, so this now brings me back to Facebook, and uh, and uh, yes, so this project was born out of a Facebook grant, but it was also born out of all these other things that were going on in my mind when I came to Facebook and when I saw this post. So Brenda posted her frustrations um, about heteronormativity and sexism in language textbooks and German textbooks in particular. Dr. Amy Young chimed in, as did I, and the Facebook thread actually led to a more serious discussion about writing a textbook. And Amy Young and I decided we were gonna do this and we were gonna do it as an open an educational resource as something for free. So we started out um, thinking really about how we might build, uh, build a more inclusive curriculum. We were keenly aware of the disconnect. I should advance my slides there, sorry. We were keenly aware of the disconnect between what our students experience in their daily lives and what's depicted in the learning materials that we bring into our classrooms. Um, so we're hoping to provide materials that represent both our students' lives and lives in German-speaking countries in a more um, diverse way. Another goal we had was sustainability. We wanted specific content on sustainability in the environment and also on social sustainability. And we wanted a project that provides uh, kind of sustainable, in other words, free materials for students um, and a sustainable model for us as we were doing this work. So this project has been five years in the making, but I'm piloting it now and I'm now working with materials I don't have to apologize for. Um, and we actually have six institutions piloting across the country. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, I'm just gonna show you a couple of, of examples about um, our attempt to diversify the curriculum before Luann kind of talks about some of the, the details for the project. 
So um, first of all, we, you know, we started out, as I said, wanting more diversity around gender and sexuality. So um, we have queer characters in our textbook. They exist narratively throughout the curriculum and they talk about their partners. We have images, as you can see here on the, on the slide. We have lessons on so-called patchwork families, non-traditional families. We have lessons on Vienna pride, on gender and sex. Um, here you can see in the, in the upper right corner that we use um, the pride parade to teach colors in the very beginning unit. Um, you got every color you need to teach right there in that image. Um, we also um, have illustrations with gender non-conforming and non-binary folks, and we introduce, as for example here, how to talk about pronouns um, and how to introduce your pronouns. Um, we have cultural notes about gender-friendly, gender-inclusive language that we then also model in the examples throughout. Um, where I teach, there's a demand for language to represent gender non-conforming people and, and students, so it's nice to have this built into the curriculum. We are also trying to be uh, trying to complicate the notion of the German, moving away from kind of this racialized identity of, of the German. Um, we interview some non-native speakers. Uh, there are many living in the German speaking world and we feel like it's important to include non-native speakers because students will interact with them when they are in Germany or Austria or Switzerland. Um, and I'll just say as a side note, some curricula just say we're only having native speakers. Um, there's, there's something about uh, the notion of what constitutes good German. Um, so there are, there are some people who, as they're writing, they really want only native speakers producing the language. But we decided we wanted to think about this differently. Also, there are many curricula that are Germanocentric, and we have a lot about Austria um, in this curriculum. Not so much about Switzerland right now. We would like to get that in there, so um, we'll see how that works. So we're thinking about diversity of Germans, and in a similar way, a diversity of language. Um, again, we're including non-native speakers with level appropriate proficiency. They're woven into the fabric of the curriculum just to reinforce this idea of a multicultural society. We also um, talk about and include regional differences in languages. So these are some examples here where we're presenting um, kind of different terms that are used in Austria than in Germany. We have a little uh, culture, cultural section here about some of the words related to house cleaning and how they're different in Germany and Austria. Um, in other words, we wanted an explicit discussion of German as a pluricentric language. Um, and uh, we have that in several of the cultural sections and in our vocabulary lists. Finally, we were also thinking about the diversity of ability, both in terms of representation and in terms of practice. Um, so thinking first about representation, we have illustrations with people of different abilities throughout the curriculum. Um, ability and accessibility come up in various different lessons throughout. So the image of the woman here on the left, um, uh, this is from an interview that we use in, in our housing unit. Um, she discussed in a video interview her accessible um, communal housing situation and the steps that she and her roommates went through to ensure that the space would be accessible for everyone um, as some of the members of her housing community rely on wheelchairs. Um, there are also explicit lessons on disability and accessibility in our social justice module. Um, and these lessons provide vocabulary for students, uh, not only to understand the world around them, but also to advocate for themselves as necessary. So you see here a little image of um, a vocabulary section where students learn the word for um, sign language. Um, we were also thinking um, from the start about best practices for ADA compliance for web authoring. And we worked with a consultant to help with some of these decisions, like how to make sure the color contrast and the fonts were accessible and, and readable. Um, the, the question of accessibility played a role in our decisions about the platform and the tools that we use for the curriculum, which Luann will talk about in just a minute. And as you can see here, we were careful to um, include alternative descriptions for, for images as well. 
our big debate, and I think it's still an ongoing debate, is about the videos. Um, we have not captioned all of our videos because the videos are used for listening practice. And we're worried for that um, hearing students, if they have the subtitles, they won't practice their listening skills as well. And so we have honestly been struggling what to do about this. And we have complete transcripts of all the videos that we provide to our instructors and make available to people who need them. And we're still thinking about this. I mean, ideally, we might even have like two sets of videos, one with captions and one without. We'll have to see um, about whether that's feasible from a workload perspective. Um, it's, it's a decision that doesn't sit comfortably with me, I'll be honest. Um, at the same time, I um, I strongly feel that students need to practice listening skills, and I and I worry about that. So, um, this might be something that we can talk about in our Q and A session. Um, but we are going to move on to talk more about the details of the platform and things like that. I wanted to just pause for a minute. Krista, are there any questions that have come in so far? Let's, let's see. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, let me open up the box here. Uh, nobody's typed anything while they're listening to you. Um, that's usually how this goes, though. They, they spend more time listening, which is great. <laughs> um, if anybody does have any questions, go ahead and type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, I know some people came in a little late. I noticed people popping in after we'd already started. So if you're wondering anything from the beginning, you definitely ask about that. Um, but nobody had any questions at the at, as you were type as you were talking, as I said. Okay. Um, I'll give a few seconds for anybody who does want to get anything out there. Um, but I just want to say I think it's uh, having so many options in the in this in this textbook is something that is that people don't realize. It's kind of a subconscious thing that you're just learning the language. You know, going to that very first car um, cartoon you had, the pictures are ugh, no big deal. It's just I'm trying to learn the language. And I kind of only half, half even pay attention to what the pictures are I'm looking at because it's just, did I, did I learn this word? Mm -hmm. But that all matters. It's there in the back of your head. I mean, and it comes from wherever you are looking at it from. When I looked at that uh, uh, cartoon myself, my thinking was, this is some scary stalker feeling uh yes. <laughs> stories what i'm seeing here he doesn't know her he's just all he's in is seeing her he he thinks she's pretty and now she's he's gonna get a job and who knows what would happen if he stuck around and his parents did not drag him away <laughs> yeah. um and i'm like i didn't like that story at all no that's not not cool no. yeah I think uh, you you have the same reaction that most of my <laughs> students have so um <laughs> yeah yeah all right, Luann. Um, we do have a question oh, though that okay. I think you may have mentioned it, but it's more of a, a kind of a big, uh, big picture kind of question. Um, why do you feel showing alternative lifestyles in learning um, a language is important? That's kind of like a big. Well, hmm. I would say it is. Um, so it's only an alternative lifestyle to people who aren't living it. Right. I mean, that what what happens in language classes is that we start with the very basic things. We start talking about ourselves and really what we want is for students to be able to talk about themselves um, at the very beginning. Right. We start out with lots of conversations about this is me. This is my family. This is what I eat. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what I do. Um, hey, you learn and, the words. Yeah, I you know, learn the words. When I learned French. My name is so and so. I live right. at. I go to wherever. Yeah. Yes. It's all, yeah. yeah. And so we want to have we want to make sure that um, students can describe their own lives and can describe the lives of the people that they see around them. Um, and um, for many of my students, this is important. I, I had a student who started at McAllister who had to write in beginning German about her family. And she went and looked up the plural form of mother um, so she could talk about her two mothers. And mm -hmm. the instructor didn't know about this and corrected it, right? Like, oh, that's not right. But it actually was right, right? So we need to be thinking about how can we provide the language that, that students need to describe themselves, but also to describe the world in which they inhabit. And the world in, in which they live has 
a huge variety of mm -hmm. types of family constructions. Um, and so, you know, it's also similar in our food unit. We talk about veganism and, re and, and dietary restrictions and allergies um, and reasons why people choose to eat in certain ways, be they religious or ethical or environmental. Um, we feel like it's important that food is not a neutral topic, right? It, it can be loaded and it says a lot more about, about ourselves and our identities. So we want to make sure that that language is available for students. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. All right. Yeah. Um, right now, like there's any other, oh, says, thank you for your answer. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. I, I hope that was satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can imagine too, as you're talking about it, I was thinking that it can make it, um, and it makes it weird, less distracting when there is just so many, op we, we know the world's got all of these different permutations of people and who they are and what they do. And if it's just in there as, well, this is, you know, as a, no brainer. It's like, well, of course, we're going to show all sorts of different um, ethnicities or um, genders or whatever. And it's just in there as a, it is, it, it's just naturally there. No big deal. It's less distracting when you have like that story. When I was looking at that, I'm supposed to be learning the language, but now I'm, I'm annoyed about the yeah. story. Yeah. And if it's just, here's all the different things that are out there and it's just normal. And that takes away the distraction from, well, why is it about this? Why is, why am I not seeing someone like the, the girl in the drawing with the prosthetic leg and things like that, you know, mm -hmm. showing that these are all just how it is. And we're just here for the language and it's language is going to be about all of these things. Exactly. You can focus on, I'm just here for the language, not all this distraction of how terrible this textbook is. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And I just want to say again, it's a great textbook in many ways, but there's this underlying problem. Yeah, right. exactly. I guess the one other thing I want to just point out is that um, both the Modern Languages Association, MLA, and the American Psychological Association, the APA, um, have recently changed their style guides to include the singular they, right? right. So yep. instead, in fact, it is now preferred instead of writing about the student, he, she, right? He or she, it's now the student, they, if you don't know the gender of the student. This is how our language is evolving and it's evolving in ways that really make sense. Mm -hmm. So partially too, we want to um, be able to talk about what does that look like in German? Um, what, what are the alternatives in German, given that our students are coming from a context in which this, this is um, very common, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, for example, Luann and I both introduced ourselves with our pronouns the way we, uh, the way we typically do at our institution um, so that we're not making assumptions about gender identity. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I'll let you go on to the next section. All right. I'll jump into a few uh, details and um, just kind of an overview. But if there are more questions at the end, we can uh, dig into more of the inclusivity decisions or more of the technical kinds of decisions as people are interested. Yeah, I'll just remind everyone, whenever you think of a question, just go ahead and type it in and we'll, you know, and, you know so, don't, so I don't want you to forget something you might have wanted to ask about and we'll grab it when um, we have our, um, when it's next, uh, makes sense to have a little break. All right, so uh, accessibility and open source were major decision drivers in the decision of using WordPress and H5P plugins. So the, both of these um, fit the bill for accessibility and open source software, and also have the added benefit of easily being able to embed the videos and the H5P content. Um, one unique thing about the site is that it's actually multiple WordPress sites that have been seamlessly put together to appear as one site. And so um, when you go to Grenzen Los Deutsch, you'll see that there are multiple language levels. And then for each language level, there are topics and then the individual lessons within the topics that um, multiple site-ness uh, was helpful for the authors so that they each had their own individual site to log into and edit, and also uh, gave uh, Brit the super user access so she could log into each of those uh, different sites as needed and then weave them together. 
Um, and then using the open source software ties into wanting to make this fully open so that others can reuse, revise, redistribute in different formats and without barriers, the proprietary barriers. Uh, we'll look at a timeline in the next slide, but just to give you an idea of what kinds of uh, learning objects are in the curriculum. There are textual elements, but then there are also images, illustrations, video, audio, H5P interactives. And the data management plan that was created as part of getting an NEH, um, National Endowment for the Humanities grant, really laid the roadmap for describing what kinds of files um, or what kinds of objects would be used, what file formats they would be in, and what the long-term management would be for those different objects themselves. And so thinking about making sure that the files are in uh, open file formats, that they have great interoperability for long-term storage and reuse by others, and also contain the Creative Commons license, the CC BY non-commercial share alike for others to uh, revise, remix, reuse, redistribute, and retrain, retain uh, following the definition of open educational resources. And content DM and digital commons repositories managed by the McAllister DeWitt Wallace Library were identified for ongoing storage and open sharing of the learning objects themselves. Um, there are a lot of kind of project management details we can get into if people have interest in those. Uh, one thing that I find interesting about the photos is that they are um, have subject uh, metadata tags in both English and German. So that helps in the discovery and reuse by others in the long term. So we'll move on to the timeline just to give you an idea of how this process and project has evolved. So as Britt was saying, in 20, 2015 was the initial idea, the light bulb that went off. And uh, there was a lot of planning and around that. There was an initial smaller local grant that was received and lots of planning, um, some collecting uh, in Germany that was happening for uh, video and photos. And then in 2017, there was the major NEH grant that was received. And so that really got the ball rolling. And from there, um, there was workshop planning and getting the WordPress site set up. And in 2018, the entire authoring team went to Vienna and um, this is where they really workshopped and figure out how they wanted to structure this, what kinds of topic areas they wanted to uh, use, and uh, did a lot of the major collecting of videos and, and photos. And um, from there on, just a lot of authoring and editing of, especially of the videos and uh, Brit started piloting in 2019 and then three additional institutions and now up to six institutions that are piloting the, um, the website. So it's really an iter iterative process where they are getting feedback from the pilot institutions and the students using the textbook and making changes as they are building that third level of language, um, the, the, the language level <laughs> going through it. Yeah, so should we take a break here or are there any questions that came in? Um, let's see, no, they haven't, anybody has any questions about the process, definitely a type in. Um, I do, like this is, I actually, I love open access and open source type stuff like this um, because it's not in stone. 
that it isn't like I mean I know you had shown that the original previous textbook you could get new editions of it in loose leaf pages or whatever but something like this being online and being able to as it's used did we do the right thing are they learning the language is 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 it is, is it working and being able to just jump in there and just you know make a change to it is is awesome I think yeah, that's, I'm a it's one of my pet things that I like <laughs> And I'm glad that this is how this is going. So I know this it's being uh, tested in some universities so far. And I see on that timeline, you still have stuff to be done next year, at least until it's a final project, final thing, I guess. Is that still some work to be done? We are still, um, so first of all, I fear with the big collection of websites like this, it will never be done, done. It will never be <laughs> off of my to-do list, right? Um, but uh, yeah, we are still, the, the way the um, curriculum is structured is that we have um, six modules, which are content areas. And then within each module, we have three units of increasing linguistic complication um, uh, of increasing difficulty. So for instance, in my German 101 class, I teach most of the unit one. So I do unit one of family and friends, unit one of shopping and food, unit one of travel and transport and so on. Um, and then in my second semester class, we do, we finish up a unit one and we do a number of the unit twos. Um, what we are still do, what we the the board of authors is still doing is authoring some of the unit threes. They're not quite done yet. They're mm -hmm. kind of icing on the cake with the idea that they could be used for a third semester, but it mm -hmm. could be that there is a, a specific topic that the students or the instructor are really, um, it's a topic that they are very interested in, invested in, and they want to go into more depth um, with yeah. a little bit more complexity. So it builds in, it's meant to be a pretty sequenced uh, mm -hmm. curriculum in the first units, a little bit more flexible in the second, and very flexible in the third, so it can be used yeah. in different ways. Yeah, we, as they learn joked, more and they realize what they might want to know more about. Yeah. Exactly, and we joked it's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure language curriculum. <laughs> I mean, you can't do that at the beginning. You got to learn kind of you basic, basic things first, you but it, as yeah. you progress, yeah, yeah. Nice, okay. Uh, no, doesn't look anybody has qu any questions about this section yet. Uh, any other ones? So yeah, go right ahead. All right, so let's jump into how are we doing this? And the answer is collaboration. So there are multiple pieces of collaboration, um, multiple levels. I'll start out with the level that I'm most familiar with, McAllister College, and um, several areas and offices individuals around McAllister that have put in time and effort and ideas into this project. So um, one of the areas here is digital liberal arts and this is a group that included a, po a postdoc in the digital liberal arts, ITS and other individuals and they were really integral in getting the WordPress site and other technical consultations in order at the very start. Um, also, the uh, summer faculty student research program. Uh, for one summer, there was a student that was collecting uh, images and video in Germany um, before the large workshop that came later. And then in subsequent summers, there were students in the studio art major that were um, creating the illustrations for the project. And then also the library. Uh, I've just been on the project for not even two years. Um, so before I arrived at McAllister, um, there was strong support from the library director, Terry Fischel, and work and enthusiasm from a librarian, Ron Joslin, uh, Britt mentioned them at the beginning. That's where she had gone and seen a presentation about OER in general. And uh, Ron wrote the grant data management plan. Uh, he did a lot of training with the author group on things such as the Creative Commons licensing and platform. And he was also part of the team that traveled to Vienna in order to workshop 
and collect and create additional content. And in addition, there are library student employees that continue to work on editing video. And uh, Britt, you have uh, another student employee that's working on photo metadata. So, so many hands are helping out on this. Yeah, and um, I just want to reiterate that it was the library at McAllister that embraced this project first. Like, this would not have happened without our amazing library and the staff there who saw the potential for this project and supported me not only with a cheerleading rah rah you go, but also with um, giving us, you know, giving us staff time and support for this project. So um, I just, you know. Yay libraries, all right. Um, uh, you know, one, um, we have a, a board of authors and a board of editors and um, really partially we were thinking about how to build, in, if, if inclus inclusivity and diversity is the goal, um, it really helps to have multiple voices, uh, you know, including queer and disabled folks, as well as people from a variety of backgrounds actually write the lessons, right? So um, we recruited authors and editors from all over the world. Um, they are all people with um, PhDs in German, but who are working in different locations, um, some inside of academia, some outside of it. Um, and so we have some lovely, uh, just amazing people who've worked on this project, who have volunteered their time for this project, um, as well as volunteer interviews, uh, interviewees. So the majority of our listening texts are, are video interviews and audio interviews with people who just volunteered to spend some time talking with us and um, answering questions about whatever we were working on. So. Um, I will say that that was a particularly fun part of the project. You don't usually meet someone and then launch into 20 questions about their apartment um, and and <laughs> getting them to describe all of the details. But it was it was just lovely. Um, we had an incredible interview volunteers. And um, as we mentioned, we have six institutions piloting the curriculum right now. I'm particularly particularly happy because. Last year we piloted, we had three small liberal arts colleges piloting. Um, and we kind of had to suspend the second part of the pilot institution, uh, the pilot project, because when we pivoted to remote instruction, it just seemed like too much for people to kind of continue to fill out forms and do surveys as well. Um, so we've kind of restarted this year. Um, and there's been a lot more interest, oddly enough, in this project, an online curriculum, as many people are teaching remotely. Um, mm -hmm. I will say that for the three of us piloting last spring, switching to remote was no big deal at all. We had pretty much everything we needed. Um, and this year we have a big state school, we have a community college, we have a private university and three small liberal arts colleges piloting the curriculum. We are collecting information twice a semester from both students and instructors about the curriculum and, and hearing about how it's working for them. Um, so as we see, this is our, I'm just going to look, you know, kind of scroll through this quickly. Um, uh, we have a board of authors, an editorial board. We work collaboratively. We call ourselves a collaborative working group. We do group decision making about the project. Um, and so there really is this collaboration across the world with authors, editors, piloters, students, video uh, uh, interview volunteers, um, and our our list of, of um, credits on the website is long indeed because we have gotten help from so many, many people. Um, as with any big project, we've learned a lot. We started out with this goal of what we wanted. When we started, we didn't have any idea about what platform to use or how to choose that, and we have just gotten help along the way. Um, I would say there have been many specific lessons we've learned about technology, about planning and workflow and tasks, about unknown things that come up with projects. 
but really um, the biggest lessons learned have been about collaboration, about how to kind of build this collaborative work across campus and across campuses um, to gather the expertise that we needed to do this project. Um, I didn't know how to use WordPress or H5P when I started this, and uh, you know what, now I do. Um, uh, but I needed to learn that from people, and fortunately, there were many experts who were willing to spend time teaching me. There's also the time needed to coordinate across all of the moving parts. Um, and this, I think, has probably been our biggest challenge. Um, you know, I have a full-time job. In fact, I have two jobs, right? Uh, I have my, my job in German and my job in kind of faculty development and administration, um, and I'm running this project on top of it. Um, just like me, everyone involved is doing other jobs as well, and finding the time is, is sometimes a challenge to keep things moving forward. Um, I think we all know that with big projects. Um, there's also a little bit of precariousness about this type of project in terms of the ability for everyone to continue to support or to contribute as planned. Um, uh, you know, we've had one of my colleagues on the um, board of authors has had six different jobs during this project um, and has relocated multiple times, including across the Atlantic. Um, uh, we've, and, and she's the extreme case, but we've had other people in similar situations. Um, there's, there is job precarity out there, um, and there are things that just change in our lives that um, make it hard for us to continue to um, contribute our time and energy in the way that we would like. Um, we've had, um, you know, of course, those family things, personal issues coming up, um, divorces, uh, parents, loss of parents, loss of pets, um, children, child care issues, particularly right now, uh, a house fire, uh, you know, personal life gets in the way. Um, and what we've just learned is that as we, if we work together as a group, people pick up when one person can't keep going. Um, and that is really the true value of, um, of collaborating in this way is uh, life happens and we just all trust that we're doing our best and try and contribute in whatever way we can at any given moment. So, um, Again, I would say the biggest lesson learns are, are lessons that I've learned are about collaborating and about kind of trusting this group process. And um, at this point, we've mentioned Ron Jocelyn, who um, passed away in 2019. Yes, time is a is a blur. Um, he mm. was so instrumental for this project. Um, a long time um, a librarian at the Dewitt Wallace Library at um, at McAllister, um, and not only a huge cheerleader for this project, but someone who worked tirelessly on it with me um, to get it going. And we miss him a lot. So we wanted to. Um, show this lovely picture of him and and let you all know that we are thinking of him. And we are, we've got about 10 minutes. We're open for more questions mm -hmm. or more conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, anybody have any of any questions, any comments, any thoughts about the um, presentation? Get that into your question section there and we can uh, talk about it, no problem. Um, we have plenty of time, of course. Uh, so uh, this is still, as you're saying, a work in progress, but can I see you've got the Creative Commons um, license there at the bottom. Even though this is not finished yet, is this something that other people can still, you know, borrow and use themselves, even if you guys are not yes. finished yet? Yes, there is enough there that, you know, so six institutions are piloting and have an entire year's worth of curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so there is plenty of material there. The the photos are also available. Um, one of the things I'm loving about the H5P activities is that um, 
Moodle is my LMS at my institution, my learning management system, and Moodle talks to yeah. H5P really well. So the great thing about the Creative Commons licensing is that I can just download whichever H5P activities I want to use for my uh, low stakes assessments and then just upload them directly into Moodle. We have people um, working with h5p.com and um, and using Canvas as their LMS and working that way. Um, and yes, there are many, many places using, if not the entire curriculum pieces of it, um, it is up and available for use. Okay. Oh, um, and the videos are all housed on a Vimeo site. So there are also, oh, if people are interested in just working with videos on very specific topics, that's available as well as all the photos on Content DM. Um, mm. Not all the photos yet. We're still photo tagging and working on uploading those, but many, but there are a couple thousand photos up. Wow, yeah. Um, so we do have a question, um, and you might have partially just been talking about this, but maybe some more specifics. Um, so how does a person use this without going to one of the colleges? So if you're not actually a uh, staff or a student at one of the colleges who is testing this out, is this something that just anybody could go and use? Yes. How would it, they do that? <laughs> you go to uh, krenzenlos-deutsch.com. It's it's a published website, right, uh, Luann? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is live. Um, <laughs> if I put uh, the links in the chat, will people see them? Um, yeah, we can get in there. And they're also linked from the session description, too. Right. I have um, that um, here. Let me. I can put in links to the Vimeo and the content DM, too. Yeah, I'm going to switch my screen and I'm going to show because I have it open, but I can also show everyone. Um, that this is the session page for this show, and this will be when we put the recording out as well, the same info. And there's a link right there to the actual site, which I've popped open over here. Yeah. So yeah. this is something that anybody can go here and start. Yep. Like, I don't know, start with the curriculum at the beginning and yep. just go through it. Yep. You don't need an instructor to guide you through it, I guess, maybe is the... No, I mean, we did really design it thinking about using it in the classroom as something that we would that we would use, but, um, uh, you know, in our classrooms. Uh, but it's also, you know, Krista, you want to learn some German? Go ahead. Start <laughs> with Familie und Freunde, Einheit Eins. Um, uh, if you click on that, uh, if you scroll up a little bit, Krista, and you click on um, the curriculum button again at the top, Mm -hmm. um, and now you see you can go to le there's all the different uh, lessons and each oh, lesson okay. has an ex has an expansion and a weiterung an expansion so I typically try and teach at least most of the content from the main lesson in class and assign the expansion as as homework um, although you know there's usually some stuff from the lessons as well um, yeah yeah Yep, so it's out there for anyone to use. Mm -hmm. um, my team and I have been presenting at various different conferences and um, and we know that there are a number of people who are pulling in certain pieces, um, certain lessons, um, as well as the institutions that are that are piloting the entire curriculum. Well, this is one thing that, you know, personally did kind of catch my eye as well. My, my brother-in-law's family is German. And mm -hmm. they, he actually travels with, regularly with my sister to Germany and Austria to visit friends and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it might be fun sometime to shock them with <laughs> yeah. knowing something. <laughs> knowing something. You could that's go it. down to lesson seven, uh, Krista, and that's the, the one with the colors. And you can see that how the just the main lesson, um, if you if you move just to the, yeah, uh, that's the expansion. But the main lesson um, has... Uh, yeah, it has that colors picture that I that I showed, oh, um, yep. mm -hmm. and with a image hotspot, uh, so that you can click and learn the different colors. Yeah. Cool. Nice. And this is oh, and the question: Is there a class or free? This is all free for obviously, because I'm just clicking yep. on things here. <laughs> yes, all yeah. free. Yep. And that's the key: yeah. the open access. Yeah. So it's yeah. something that can both be used just by an individual might want to learn themselves mm -hmm. or by um, an actual instructor or professor or teacher somewhere who is wanting to use this as part of what they are doing as a you know, more official curriculum in a class. Exactly. 
exactly. Nice. Um, so uh, what about, I know you're doing German because that's what you teach. Is there any talk or has anyone reached out to you about any other languages using the same format, I suppose, maybe, or? Um, I have- Other language learning? Yeah, I think, I mean, there are a number of, of um, OERs out there for language learning, some open textbooks that are available. Um, I can think of uh, a couple for Spanish um, and for French. Um, and uh, a couple of uh, people have reached out to me about the National Endowment of the Humanities um, grant that we got through the, it's a digital advancement grant through their Office of Digital Humanities. Um, and so I believe there was someone who was interested in doing something similar for Japanese and um, they reached out to just talk with me about the process so um, these things are um, proliferating I mean I think that many people are having the experience that I had um, both around cost and accessibility <laughs> related mm -hmm. to cost <laughs> um, yeah, and but, yeah. about the need for online curricula right now I think um, many uh, college and university libraries are are really thinking a lot about open educational resources and how to support the development mm -hmm. of them. So um, I found out just this past summer that a, a, a colleague from Canada whom I had even met once did a German uh, a, did a German curriculum as well. So we're talking too. I'm I'm sending my students to her curriculum for extra practice. It's it's a different type of project, but I'm I'm thinking that they're that we're going to see more and more of this. And I'm I'm hearing about more and more of these projects and hearing about more interest in doing it. Um, and like you you're saying, the, the world that we're living in now, we have been for months and months so much is going online. Yes. Um, I mean, and you said you guys went, it was easy for you to transfer to do it. Uh, my show here, Encompass Live, we've been doing Encompass Live for over 10 years as an online yeah. webinar. So yeah, really nothing changed for me much. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> it did, we used to, we would previously, before a pandemic, we would in locally bring presenters like yourself here into the library, into the commission. We have meeting rooms here we had broadcast from. Mm -hmm. We don't do that anymore. Everybody's remote, even our, even if my own staff, our own staff here is doing something there in their office, I'm in my office. But mm -hmm. it is, and our, I know, you said you things that easier, a lot more people interested in it. In March, April, May, our attendance skyrocketed on the because everybody was locked down, librarians were looking for for just something to do or needing their professional development or um, whatever, and things have just gotten crazy. And this is where we're going. And I, and now that we've been into it and have so many people have settled into it more, I think, realizing this doesn't have to stop after this is over. Mm -hmm when everything is, is you know, the pandemic is, is done and we are going back to our offices as normal, this kind of remote learning, it's been going on, but it can even be more. Yeah. Um, I've, yeah. I've heard from, you know, we deal with public libraries doing their story times online now right. through um, either face, you know, uh, Facebook or Zoom or whatever, and saying, well, this is just for now, and getting responses back from parents saying, we, I wish we would keep doing this. I can't bring my kids into the library we're pandemic, we're not having anything to do with it, just timing wise and schedule wise. But my kids are now getting to attend, to attend story time this way and libraries are realizing, oh, it's a new thing we can do and keep doing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's gonna be a huge change in how everything is done after this. And this is one of those things that, um, kind of perfect timing that you're working on this particular right. version now. <laughs> yes. I do want to say like I think um I think uh there is a lot of interest in in projects like this. I think the online component as well as the OER component um is is pretty important. Um the thing I'm going to say is that funding is the biggest challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Um if you're writing something that is free, how are you going to come up with the funds to do that if you're not working with a publishing company and so um you're not charging the students you know, for the cost of the book anymore so right you know what. right yeah. right so 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 what's a sustainable model for doing this um uh and you know doing this in other areas and you know the the um 
NEH is really important for many, many digital humanities projects, um, the mm -hmm. National Endowment for the Arts too, for funding for types of these types of things. But, you know, we're also seeing some bigger um, non-for-profit institutions that are su that are supporting that you know um, philanthropic institutions that are supporting OER development and targeting it as a way to reduce the cost of college um, and university overall and I think we're going to have to rely on things like that um, I most of my team has not been paid for this work that we're doing like our expenses to go to Vienna those things are we're paid, right? But um, uh, and as the project, as as the co-PI, I got a pretty minimal stipend to, for preparing for the workshop. But mm -hmm. mostly, I'm not paid for the work that I'm done for this, uh, that I've done for this. Um, and 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 there's also a you know another thing that doesn't sit quite comfortably with me is that my team is not compensated either they are committed and passionate to this project and want to do it but i think our um one of our challenges for the future is thinking about how do we come up with funding for mm -hmm. this type of work that will be sustainable for the people who are doing it and continue to make it free for the students yeah you can't just keep tossing more work onto people and not giving them some sort of you know we all have good hearts right but there's a limit <laughs> Yeah, I think it's I think it's just going to be changing. OER is is it's been around for a long time, but it's getting even bigger. And I think yeah, everyone's just going to have to switch their thinking into how how things are done, how college and you and you know studying is done, and how learning is done. That buying two, three, four hundred dollar textbooks is that is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. There are people who are not going to college because they can't afford that, and they just say, well. I can't afford that. I'm just not going to do it at all. And that's horrible. Yeah. 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 All right. So we're a little after 11 o'clock. That's okay. We started a little after 10 central time. Does anybody have any um, last minute desperate questions they need to ask of Luana Britt? You can type into your question section. Um, I did attempt to share the links. Lynn shared a link to um, the uh, Vimeo site for the and the content jam site. I will also add those in case you didn't grab them through here through the chat today. I will add those to the session page, um, this page here, uh, when I put up the recording so you everybody will have access to those links directly as well. In case you want to just jump to those to look at the pictures on the content DM that are still being loaded and the videos that are up there. Um, but I will say this is great. I'm I'm so glad I was able to get you guys on here today. Uh, this is one of if anyone who's watching has been watching over this uh, summer. Um, many of my shows have been uh, the live. There's a um, at McAllister College Library Technology Conference, which I've attended before. Was supposed to happen in March of this year, but did not due to pandemic. And I have tried to help out by um, putting many of the sessions that were originally going to be on that conference. Uh, on our show. So I was glad I was able to get you guys too. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting us, Krista. This has been, it's been really nice to do this presentation that we planned for March um, yeah. and um, to have this venue. So thank you for all that you're doing. You're welcome. Thank you. I feel bad that people couldn't attend. I didn't get to attend and see everybody again. So hopefully they'll do it and again in the future. Um, but, well, it doesn't look like anybody is typing any um, questions, so I think I will wrap it up. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Britt and Lynn. This was great. Um, I'm going to go and learn myself some German, and I have all in all my free time. <laughs> um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Uh, the recording will be available by the end of this week. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, tomorrow is a holiday for me as being a state agency um so i'll start working on that um afterwards uh, they're going to send me a link to the slides on the google slides so I have a link to that our archives are available here underneath our upcoming shows so this is where um at the top of this list most recent ones at the top there'll be a link here for today's show a link to the recording we put up onto our library commission youtube channel and a link to the slides uh, while we're here, I'll show you, this is in our archives, we do a search feature here, you can search our entire show archives if you want to, to uh, watch any previous shows, you can do the full archives, or you can do just the recent 12 months, and I did just mention the reason we have this limit is because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, Encompass Live premiered in January 2009, 
and our full show archives are here on this giant page. I'm not going to scroll all the way down because that would be crazy. But if you do search this, you will find shows all going all the way back to the beginning. Um, so feel free to browse our archives, watch any of our previous shows. Um, but pay attention to the original broadcast dates. You never, um, some many shows will stand the test of time, reading lists, things that are, you know, ongoing um, projects. But some things, information may become outdated, uh, services and products may change, uh, links might no longer work, uh, some things might no longer exist anymore. So um, just pay attention when you're watching a show. There's always a date of when it was originally broadcast on here. But uh, we are librarians. We archive things. We keep things for historical purposes. It's what we do. So we'll always keep our full archives on here for you. Just make sure you do pay attention when you are watching. We do also for Encompass Live, we do post push out into social media, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we use the hashtag Encump Live, a little abbreviation. And we have a link here to our uh, Facebook page, which I've opened over here, um, where we do remind people to log in. Here's a reminder I posted this morning, log in right away. When information about highlighting our speakers, when our recordings for previous episodes are available. So uh, if you do like to use Facebook to keep up on things, give us a like over there. Uh, otherwise, you can also just look for the hashtag. Here it is from here, Encomp Live on any various social media you like to use. So uh, next week's show, I'll help you join us for that. We are talking about summer reading next year, summer reading 2021. Uh, planning is already in the works, I know, at many public libraries. And Sally Snyder, who is our coordinator for Children's and Young Adult Library Services, will be with me to talk about titles and the topic for next year, Tales and Tales. Uh, I love that. Um, so books about um, animals is what we're, the topic is for next year. So please do join us for our next week's show and any of our other shows. I've got December dates filling up, so keep an eye on the schedule to see what new top shows come up. Um, and that, thank you very much, and hopefully we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>